Genevieve, uh, or Genevieve Kinecki, re representing Rhode Island Right to Life, and Rachel Orsinger. Rachel Orsinger may be in the hall. Thank you. You may begin. Madam Chairwoman and members of the committee, my name is Genevieve Kinecki, and I am speaking today on behalf of the Rhode Island State Right to Life Committee. Thank you for this opportunity to testify in opposition to House Bill Number 7223, which would repeal the requirement that physicians performing an abortion not notify the husband of the patient, if any, before the abortion is performed. Social scientists agree that there is a father factor in nearly all the social issues that are plaguing America today. With the absence of a father in the home, we see the potential for po poverty rises fourfold. Emotional and behavioral problems in childhood rise significantly. Drug and alcohol abuse in adolescence rises substantially. And there is significantly more criminal activity leading to incarceration. While each of these is a tragedy on a human level, the collective cost to the wider community is both social and financial, with government programs trying to pick up the slack where fathers fail to father. Groups such as the National Fatherhood Initiative and the Fatherhood Project are just two examples of the growing efforts attempting to counter this problem by providing research, education, and mentoring. And they have partnered with government entities in this time of crisis in order to try to restore the stability to children's lives that fathers provide. Now the advent of each new human person, usually through a positive pregnancy test, can elicit a range of responses from joy to anger, from wonder to fear, from gratitude to deep, deep anxiety. Certainly a new baby is a tremendous responsibility both emotionally and financially, and one that will change a family forever. The father of a, file, of a, father of a child can be assured of sleepless nights, exhaustion for years to come, a financial commitment that will only one day transfer from this child to his grandchildren. And excuse a sense me. of responsibility that will transfer. Excuse me. Yes. Um, I'm having a little trouble finding I will tie the connection it. with I will tie it all up at the end. The legislation. I promise you. Thank you. But the flip side of this news is the joy of the first smile, seeing a new life alone through the eyes of his child. That first trip to Dell's, the first trip to the beach, father-daughter dances, little league victories, and late night chats about the meaning of life. Family life is a mixed bag with highs and lows throughout, but most fathers would agree that the challenges and difficulties are worth it, and those who have learned from their experiences are more than happy to assist others who need a helping hand. The desire to combat this current crisis in fatherhood is shared by men of all walks of life and by the government, whose best interest is served by stable families and fewer expenses exhausting its limited resources. Wouldn't it be supremely ironic at this point in our social history to undermine the support for fatherhood by suggesting that first, fathers don't matter to the lives of their children, and secondly, that fatherhood could be taken from a man without his knowledge. To give a married woman sole autonomy over the fate of her child who carries half of his or her DNA from the father is to make the husband's responsibility in the matter inconsequential. This notion is exactly the opposite of what the government elsewhere is working to provide. Fathers matter, and fatherhood in the home is of great consequence. But secondly, the father is already a father by the nature of the existence of a child, and it behooves us to let him know of that privilege. The outcome may not be in his hands entirely, but it would undermine our integrity as a state to suggest that he need never be told. As a legislative body, we owe him that courtesy and we would be hard-pressed to explain our support for the well-being of children without acknowledging the importance of their fathers at every opportunity. Thank you. Kinnicky. All right. Are there questions for Ms. Kinnicky? There being none, thank you. Thank you. Rachel Orsinger. Madam Chair. Thank you. On behalf of the Rhode Island Coalition Against Domestic Violence, our six member agencies who serve victims and their families throughout the state of Rhode Island, and SOAR, our task force of survivors of domestic violence, I really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to you about this bill. Um, just starting out with sort of dry procedural notes, this is um, an old law that 
was declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court of the United States in 1992 when, uh, in Planned Parenthood versus Casey. And if you go and you read Section C of that Supreme Court uh, decision, you'll understand why I am here on behalf of domestic violence survivors, because the Supreme Court's entire reasoning, really, about why spousal notifications are unconstitutional is about the extreme undue burden and often a dangerous lethal burden that that sort of requirement places on domestic violence victims. What the findings in the lower court had found was that about 99% of women did, in fact, notify their spouses, and that in the vast majority of cases when they were not willing to notify their spouses, it was because of a fear of violence and existence of violence in the home relationships. Um, the court found that they needed to look not at whether this bill worked for the entire population, most of whom would not be burdened at all, but specifically for that slice that was going to get that heavy burden. And those are those particularly vulnerable victims of domestic violence. In my written testimony, I've included some of the Supreme Court's language explaining the specific fears that they had. Um, so I wanted to try to reserve my short time here to explaining why it is that this unenforceable law is still such a problem. Um, even being unenforced, someone who goes onto your legislator website and looks up this law will see that the language of the spouse notification requirement is still there. They will think that they are required to tell their spouse if that is something that they feel will endanger them. It's going to have that same chilling effect as if this law were still fully um, in effect and enforced. Therefore, we ask you to pass this bill and um, repeal the language so that we have clarity and no burden on people who are just trying to keep themselves and their families safe. Thank you. Are there questions for Ms. Orsinger?